Last time, Antiochus had made peace with Egypt following his defeat at Raphia, and now turned to deal with the rebel general Achaeus in Anatolia. Achaeus had been in revolt for four years by this time, but his control over the region had been flimsy. Lacking the greater manpower he once possessed in his position as a Seleucid general, the rebel king had been unable to take Pergamon, and had even struggled to defeat minor cities such as Selge in Pisidia. The details of Antiochus' initial invasion over the Taurus Mountains in 216 BC are unknown, but it seems highly unlikely that Achaeus was able to provide any significant resistance in the field. The Seleucid army continued to gradually advance along the royal road until it at last reached Achaeus' stronghold at Sardis, which was invested with a siege in 215 BC. Sardis had been the subject of significant investment by successive Seleucid rulers, who used the city as their base in Anatolia, and as such it was exceedingly well fortified. In his defense of the city, Achaeus fought something of a guerrilla campaign, regularly launching raids and ambuscades against Antiochus' soldiers, while Antiochus attempted to starve out the city, rather than make a direct assault. In this way, Achaeus managed to defend his capital for over a year. Lagoras, a Cretan mercenary who had been in the service of Ptolemy Philopator during the Fourth Syrian War, was now in the service of Antiochus. He had devised a plan to break the siege and finally take Sardis. Lagoras, during his years of fighting, had developed a working theory that, in any siege, the least defended part of the city will be that which is naturally most defensible, as the defenders will feel the most secure there and will thus provide it with the least garrison. Along a section of the eastern wall which connected the town to the Acropolis, the ground was extremely rough and had a ravine, into which the townsfolk disposed of animal carcasses. This attracted vultures and various scavenger birds who gathered to devour the offal. After they had fed, however, the birds did not fly away, but perched themselves upon the wall, which they would not do if the walls were actively manned and patrolled. Lagoras, once he had spotted this, approached the wall under the cover of night, and noted suitable points to make escalades, which he then reported to Antiochus. Lagoras and Antiochus, together with Theodotus of Aetolia and Dionysius, the captain of the royal bodyguard, devised a plan of attack. Fifteen picked men approached the walls with ladders, early on a moonless morning, and then hid under a protruding rock, so they could not be spotted from the battlements. Once the sun rose and Achaeus' men had assembled inside the city, the chosen men began to scale the wall. The sight of this caused great excitement within the Seleucid army, the commotion of which confused Achaeus and put him on alert. Antiochus acted swiftly, marched his army to the western wall, and launched an assault on the so-called Persian Gate, creating a distraction for his infiltrators. In response, the commander of the city garrison, Arabasis, sallied forth with a detachment to defend the gate. On the other side of the city, the chosen men had climbed the battlements, and had reached the gate there, which they immediately began to cut through from the inside. At the same time, another 30 men came upon the gateway from the outside. The gate was soon forced open with a waiting force of 2,000 elite troops entering the city, and seizing the high ground around the city amphitheatre. Once this was noticed by the defenders, Arabasis' troops fighting at the Persian gate withdrew into the city, but as they retreated they were unable to close the gate behind them, allowing Antiochus in. Soon all of Achaeus' men had retreated to the stronghold of the Acropolis, while the Seleucid army ransacked and pillaged the city. In Egypt, Sisybius, Ptolemy's chief minister, had dispatched another Cretan officer, called Bolus, to Sardis, where he was to extract Achaeus from the city and bring him back to Alexandria. While Ptolemy and Antiochus had a binding peace treaty, they did not prohibit Egypt from providing aid to Antiochus' enemies. So long as Achaeus lived, then he could be furnished with soldiers and continue his civil war, keeping the Seleucid Empire divided and weak. Bolus had a relative in Antiochus' army, an officer named Cambylus. They met together and discussed what they should do, without concern for loyalty or duty, but rather their own enrichment, which was considered to be a typical Cretan attitude. They decided that the best course of action for themselves would be to split the advance payment of 10 talents from Sisybius, and then turn Achaeus over to Antiochus for further profit. Cambylus divulged the plan to Antiochus, who was sceptical, but once the details had been laid out before him, he put his full support behind the scheme, and promised that he would reward the Cretans. Under the cover of night, Bolus slipped into the Acropolis. Achaeus was grateful to see him, but also did not wholly trust him. Against the wishes of Bolus, the king only agreed to leave with four companions to protect him. 
The men dressed themselves in the clothes of commoners and began to descend from the Acropolis. Bolus positioned himself at the rear of the group, but in the dark he found it difficult to recognize which of them was Achaeus. However, his person was betrayed by the mannerisms of his companions, who showed natural deference to him, offering him aid during their descent. Once the party had reached the prearranged spot for the ambush, Bolus whistled to alert Cambylus and his men, and then personally seized Achaeus, pinning his arm so he could not make any attempt on his own life. Cambylus carried Achaeus to the tent of Antiochus, and threw the bound man at the feet of the Seleucid king. Antiochus was, for a time, speechless, and then was overcome by his good fortune, and began to cry tears of joy. The next day, the royal council met to decide what punishment would be inflicted on Achaeus. The rebel had his extremities locked off, his head was cut off and sewn up inside the skin of an ass, and his body was crucified. Antiochus then demanded the surrender of the Acropolis, but because of their confusion at what had just occurred overnight, his ultimatum was ignored. So the Seleucids continued to assault the citadel. Inside, with no clear leader, the men divided their loyalties between Arabasis and the king's widow Laodice, and fell into squabbling and fighting amongst themselves. Eventually, they recognized how hopeless their situation was, and agreed to surrender. After the siege, Seleucid soldiers were billeted in private houses, and a 5% tax was imposed on the citizens as a punishment, but these punitive measures were discontinued in 213 BC, following the granting of honors on Antiochus and his queen by the people of the city. Xuxus, who had earlier aided Antiochus during the war against Molon, was appointed as the new governor of Anatolia. With the civil war finally won, the empire in the west was reunified. However, Antiochus was not planning on stopping there. The east of the empire had been neglected for decades now, with Seleucid attention divided between Syria and Anatolia. As such, whole regions had broken away, and kingdoms which had previously been clients of the empire no longer paid any tribute. Remedying this then would be Antiochus' next goal. His first target was Armenia, a kingdom which had come into the Seleucid sphere of influence following the Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC but had more recently aided Antiochus Hyrax in his campaigns against Seleucus II Callinicus, and had since then been wholly independent. In 212 BC, Antiochus and his army appeared before the walls of the Armenian royal residence of Amosata, which lay not far from the border with Seleucid-aligned Cappadocia, and laid siege to it. Xerxes, the Armenian ruler, first attempted to flee upon seeing the sides of Antiochus' force, but after contemplating that he would probably lose his authority over the rest of Armenia if he allowed his palace to be taken, he decided to contact the Seleucids and negotiate terms. Some of the royal council advised that Antiochus should decline the conference, and instead seek to put his nephew Mithridates on the Armenian throne, but the king ignored this advice. Instead, the two kings met and came to an agreement. Firstly, Xerxes agreed to be loyal to the Seleucid crown going forward. Then, Antiochus waived most of the overdue tribute which had not been paid by the previous king, but instead took a payment of 300 talents, 1,000 horses, and 1,000 mules. Finally, to cement their alliance, Xerxes was married to Antiochus' sister, Antiochus. This was generally viewed as a magnanimous act on Antiochus' part. A surviving fragment from the 7th century historian John of Antioch very briefly mentions that Antiochus eventually murdered Xerxes in order to give Antiochus full control over Armenia. But no more is known of the affair, and contemporary scholars have cast their doubts on the veracity of the story, as there is little Antiochus had to gain by the way of duplicity which he could not have easily gained already through force of arms. Antiochus's next target would be Parthia. Back in 229 BC, Seleucus Callinicus, with a young Antiochus accompanying him, had launched a campaign against the Parthians which had begun promisingly, but then had to be abandoned to respond to an invasion from Antiochus Hyrax. Now in 210 BC, Antiochus would set out to complete his father's work. Before leaving, Antiochus had his own boy son, also named Antiochus, elevated to co-ruler purely as a precautionary measure to secure the line of succession in case tragedy struck while out on campaign. The Seleucid army sailed slowly down the Euphrates in boats which were precariously full. Justin reports that this army consisted of 100,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry. Given this would be nearly twice the size of the Seleucid army at Raphia, which was fought closer to home and against a more powerful enemy, this claim is quite questionable. 
about half that number would be more in line with what the Seleucid state was capable of fielding at the time. The army came first to Media. There at the regional capital of Ecbatana, Antiochus plundered the sacred temple to the goddess Anahita, stripping from it gold and silver to the value of 4,000 talents with which to fund his campaigns. As this was the only remaining monument of the once great city which had not yet been plundered by the Greeks, this act would not have endeared Antiochus to the locals. Nevertheless, the king deemed it necessary. The Parthian king Asazes II, son of the Asazes who had fought Callinicus, withdrew into Hyrcania in response to the Seleucid advance. As he fled, he attempted to destroy a system of desert wells to deny his enemy water, but a cavalry vanguard led by Nicomedes of Kos attacked and routed the would-be saboteurs. With no more opposition, Antiochus advanced to the city of Hecatompolos, where he decided to encamp and rest his men. However, upon observing the landscape surrounding the city, he saw that it would be perfect for a cavalry battle, which was the Parthian's forte. Therefore, Antiochus reasoned, Asazes must have been in no position to face him in battle, and on that basis decided to resume the pursuit. His first challenge would be marching north over the Elbors mountain range into Hyrcania proper, by the coast of the Caspian Sea. Once Antiochus reached the town of Tage, he learnt that the mountain tribesmen were planning on ambushing his army in the Calchanlian Pass. The king divided up his force, sending forward first the light troops, along with his pioneers who would clear the pass to make it suitable for the deployment of the heavy phalangites and to allow the pack animals through. The vanguard was led by Diogenes, who took with him archers, slingers, and men with mountaineering experience. The next contingent was 2,000 Cretans, led by Polyxenidas of Rhodes, which was followed by armoured light troops commanded by Nicomedes of Kos and Nicolaus the Aetolian. The passage was difficult. The length of the ascent was 300 stades, or about 34 miles, and the pass reached heights of 8,700 feet, with the path blocked by fallen rocks and trees, as well as artificial barricades created by the mountain men. When Diogenes encountered the first contingent of tribesmen, his light troops climbed out of the pass onto the higher ground, assaulted the enemy with missiles, seized their elevated positions, and held them while the pioneers cleared the path below. The light troops continued along the high ground in loose order, and in this way forced the tribesmen to retreat. On the eighth day of the march, the army reached Mat Labus, where the massed force of the tribesmen awaited them. They fought desperately against the Seleucid Phalanx, but at night the light troops outflanked the mountain men and appeared on the heights in their rear. Once they made themselves known, the barbarians were sent into a panic and fled. The Seleucid soldiers made to pursue them, but Antiochus sounded the bugles and prevented any chase, as he wanted to keep the army in good order. At last, descending from the pass, Antiochus reached the city of Tambrax and encamped there. All the enemy troops in the region, including many of the tribesmen who had fled, had fortified themselves in the nearby city of Syrinx, which was ringed by three moats, each with two palisades, and behind all that a strong wall. The city also contained a significant Greek quarter. Antiochus began systematically filling in the moats, and then undermined and brought down the city wall. The defenders, in an act of spite, massacred the Greek inhabitants of the town, and then attempted to flee the place under cover of night. Antiochus cut off their line of retreat, and they were forced to return to the city. Once a final assault on the breach was made, the defenders surrendered. Again here the fog of history descends and little more is known of the conflict. All that is known is that Arsazes fought bravely, but was ultimately defeated and forced to acknowledge Seleucid suzerainty, presumably in a similar arrangement to that with Xerxes. The next stage of Antiochus' grand tour would be Bactria, which had asserted its independence in 246 BC, in the aftermath of Ptolemy Euergetes' devastating invasion. Since then, Bactria had come under the rule of one Euthydemus, who had overthrown the Diodotid dynasty. Much has been speculated about the precise identity and rise to power of Euthydemus, but it is merely conjecture, as in reality we know almost nothing of this man before he came into conflict with Antiochus, other than that he was born in Magnesia, although we do not even know which Magnesia, as several cities bore that name. By 208 BC, the Seleucid king had been making inroads into Bactrian territory and was laying siege to a city when he heard that a force of Bactrian cavalry had arrived nearby on the banks of the river Arius, today called the Hari, and was holding the fort there for the rest of the army. Abandoning the siege, Antiochus went to confront them. 
After two days' march with the whole army, Antiochus detached a light force of cavalry and peltasts and advanced quickly through the night, as he had received intelligence that the Bactrian cavalry had been retiring to a nearby town every evening. This turned out to be true, and the king's detachment was able to reach the ford and get most of his men across the river before dawn. Once the sun had risen, the Bactrian cavalry returned and made battle with the Seleucids. Antiochus, at the head of 1,000 cavalrymen, met the Bactrian charge and fought brilliantly, repulsing the enemy after a bloody melee. Once more Bactrian troops arrived, the battle turned for the worse for Antiochus, and his men were pushed back. Then Panatolus, one of Antiochus' officers, came to the rescue and turned the tide of the battle, breaking the Bactrians and pursuing them, killing many and taking many more prisoner. Antiochus, for his part, had suffered the death of his horse, and had taken a blow to the mouth, which deprived him of several teeth. A small price to pay, perhaps, for a decisive victory, and for a courageous reputation. The rest of the Seleucid army arrived and encamped across the river, while a shocked Euthydemus withdrew all the way back to Bactra itself. What followed was a two-year-long siege of the city, the details of which are also lost to time. By 206 BC, both sides had suffered significant deprivation, and so negotiations were begun. Antiochus sent an intermediary named Teleus, who, like Euthydemus, was a native of Magnesia. The Bactrian monarch desired above all else to retain his position of kingship, and made multiple arguments to justify his position. He pointed out that he had never revolted against Antiochus, but rather against Diodotus, who himself was a rebel. More tangibly, he argued that without a Hellenic monarch in the region, the land would be conquered by nomadic barbarians from the steppe, and would be lost to both of them. Antiochus was open to this, and after Teleus went back and forth between the two camps, a final settlement was agreed upon. Euthydemus sent his son Demetrius to ratify the agreement. Antiochus welcomed him with royal dignity, arranged that he should marry a Seleucid princess, and gave formal permission to Euthydemus to style himself as a king. This was again a similar sort of treaty as had been signed with Armenia and Parthia, granting the local ruler autonomy, but placing them formally under the Seleucid yoke. After taking on supplies and troops from Bactria, including some elephants, Antiochus left for the east. The Seleucid army crossed over the Hindu Kush into the territory of the Moraean Empire for the first time since the days of Seleucus Nicator. But they were not there in an act of war, but rather to renew the old alliance nearly a century after its creation. However, the empire was not as it once had been, and had entered a terminal decline. The king Antiochus negotiated there with is known to us as Sophocles, but no Moraean king of this name is known, so it has been supposed by modern scholars that he was an independent ruler who had broken away part of the western portion of the crumbling empire. Sophagasenus renewed the treaty and gave tribute to Antiochus in the form of elephants and treasure, as well as providing supplies for his army. Having now traced the steps of Alexander and Seleucus, Antiochus marched back westward. While Antiochus had been undertaking his grand anabasis, Philip V of Macedon had been prosecuting his war against Rome. His first step was the construction of a large fleet, purely for the conveyance of his soldiers. As the ships were built in the Illyrian manner, they were small and quick, where they would not be able to contest the seas with larger Roman warships. Philip sailed around Greece to the Ionian Islands, and upon hearing that the Roman navy was in Sicily, he quickly continued on to Illyria. As he approached Apollonia, a rumour spread in his flotilla that the Roman fleet were on their way from Regium, which prompted Philip to quickly turn his ships around and sail all the way back to Macedonia. As it turned out, the Roman fleet was but a squadron of ten ships, which would have posed little trouble for Philip's navy. In 215 BC, after the Romans had been defeated once again, this time at Cannae, Philip sent plenipotentiaries to Hannibal and forged a formal alliance against Rome, with the Macedonian war goals being laid out as the restoration of Demetrius of Pharos and the withdrawal of all Roman influence from the Balkans. Unfortunately for Philip, while his ambassadors were sailing back to Greece, their ship was intercepted by the Romans, who discovered the treaty, which cost Philip any opportunity to take them unawares. However, the Romans were not to make any proactive military actions against Macedon, as they were far too preoccupied dealing with Hannibal's rampaging army. 
Instead, the Romans increased their patrols of the Ionian Sea and began sending envoys to a number of minor powers in the eastern Mediterranean in search of allies. In 214 BC, Philip besieged the Roman allied stronghold of Apollonia by land and by sea. Marcus Valerius Levinus set sail to relieve the city, loading his warships with soldiers and transporting more in requisition to cargo vessels. He disembarked his main force at Oricum and then sailed with a detachment of 2,000 men near to Apollonia, which he entered under cover of night and took command of. The next night the Romans silently left the city and launched an assault on the Macedonian camp. The Macedonians, not expecting the Romans, were taken completely by surprise. Philip himself fled only in his undergarments back to his ships on the river Aeolus. The Romans captured or killed some 3,000 men and seized a great number of siege weapons as well as booty from the camp. Philip, once he learned that the Roman fleet was at the mouth of the river, burnt his own navy and fled over land back to Macedon. Not discouraged by this disaster, Philip returned to Illyria in 212 BC and seized the city of Lysus, in the process defeating a large Illyrian force and gaining control over much of the surrounding country. Lysus was not directly under Roman protection, and so was a safer target, and afforded Philip an Adriatic port from which to build a new navy for the invasion of Italy. However, he would not be allowed the opportunity as by 211 BC, Lavinus had managed to turn the Aetolian League against Macedon. The Aetolians, who both desired to expand their own realm and were fearful of the power of Rome, consented to an alliance, which also included a Talos of Pergamon and the Illyrian chieftain Skirdeladas. Other states would also align themselves with Rome, including Sparta, Elis, and Rhodes. This new Grecian front proved adequate to tie down Philip and prevent him making any further inroads against Rome. With Roman naval support, the Aetolians struck swiftly, seizing Oniade and Nassos, while the Romans took the island of Zacynthus, although its citadel continued to hold out. For the campaigning season of 210 BC, Lavinus was elected as consul, and he was dispatched to the more important front in Sicily, leaving the Greeks to fight amongst themselves although a lesser force under Publius Sulpicius Galba remained in the region. Galba's chief accomplishment in this year was the capture of the island of Aegina, whose inhabitants were sold into slavery, with the island itself being handed over to the Aetolians, who in turn sold it to Pergamon in exchange for 30 talents. Without significant direct Roman aid, the danger to Macedon posed by the Roman-allied Greek states was significantly lessened and Philip managed to repel their advances at every turn. With Roman involvement reduced, Italus of Pergamon, having been elected as co-strategos of the Aetolian League, became the chief antagonist against Macedon. In 208 BC, Italus launched an assault against the city of Oreus, which was located on the north coast of Euboea while Galba's ships attacked it on the seaward side. After sacking the city, Italus moved on to the city of Opus on the mainland, which immediately surrendered. Little did he know that Philip and his army had marched 60 miles in a single day in order to arrive in the area themselves, and were able to respond to the raid immediately. Italus was only saved by some Cretan troops who spotted the approaching Macedonian army while foraging. The Pergamese men were just barely able to embark their ships and take to the seas before Philip arrived, who had to helplessly watch them sail away from the shore. However, at this time, news came to Italus that Prusius of Bithynia had taken advantage of his absence to invade the territory of Pergamon, which he was in the process of devastating. Italus returned to Asia right away, giving no more thought to the war in Greece, depriving the Aetolians of a most valuable ally. By 207 BC, Philip had once again marched on the Aetolian sanctuary at Thermon and destroyed whatever statues escaped his wrath the first time. The Aetolians, with Pergamon and Rome no longer actively involved in the conflict after a series of failed negotiations, finally agreed to a separate peace with Philip in 206 BC. In the following year, with the Hannibalic War having finally turned in the favour of the Romans, they were at last able to send a significant force to Greece. But with the Aetolians having made peace, it was too little, too late. Philip tried to goad the Roman army into battle by ravaging the lands around Apollonia, but they were unwilling to meet in a pitched battle. Shortly thereafter, the two sides met at the Epirate city of Phonicae to negotiate. 
Philip recognised Roman rule over the Parthenia region of Illyria, as well as a number of other settlements, including Demale, while Macedon would annex the region of Atintania. While this war had not been a defeat for Philip, he had wasted a golden opportunity to take all of Illyria, while Rome was on its knees against Hannibal, an opportunity the likes of which he would surely not see again. In Asia, Antiochus marched through Arachosia to Carmania, where he encamped for the winter. Following this, he arrived back in Seleucia on the Tigris. The final part of his expedition now took place. The city of Gera, inland from the eastern coast of Arabia, had long been a wealthy hub of trade in the region, sending trade caravans overland across the peninsula and sailing trading vessels up the Euphrates. Antiochus sailed south near to Gera with the intention of conquering the rich prize, but as he approached the city, the merchants sent a letter to the king, begging that they might maintain their liberty and peace. Antiochus agreed to leave the city alone in exchange for a significant tribute, 500 talents of silver, 1,000 talents of frankincense, and 200 talents of myrrh. Afterwards, the king sailed to nearby Tylos, modern Bahrain, and then returned to Seleucia. Antiochus's five-year eastern expedition had reasserted Seleucid control over the long-neglected upper satrapies and had, by way of vassal states, restored the empire to its greatest extent since the reign of Antiochus II Theos. This accomplishment amazed the Greek world, and as such, the king became widely known as Antiochus the Great. At last now had appeared a monarch who, could perhaps take up the mantle of Alexander and finally reunite the Hellenes under one banner. Full of enthusiasm after his eastern victories, Antiochus now cast his eyes once again towards his ancient enemy, Egypt. Next time, Antiochus, seeking to avenge his youthful defeat at Raphia, will once again invade Kole Syria, beginning a fifth Syrian war. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, Please post them below, and thank you for listening.